Uh, one thing I wanted to point out to you is over on the right, uh, or <coughs> the left, over in that corner, uh, there are a number of books that represent some of the trips that were taken, uh, pictures that represent some of the ministry that was done, little symbols uh, that are over there. And uh, if you have some time, we hope you'll take advantage of that uh, and uh, take a look at that. Um, what we want to try to present uh, today, on um, uh, far back I need to go here, um, is an explanation, the sense of the mission of what's going on and where we are in the development of that ministry. And it's got some history. If you look at your outline, you're going to uh, get kind of a picture of where we came from, uh, what the sense is of this, and uh, why we're doing it. Uh, what you have here is a picture that was designed, a symbol that was designed by Pastor Arol. Uh, and it includes, if you can see it, sometimes it's stylized, want to make sure you get it. Uh, those are hands that are holding the bread and the chalice with Christ at the center. And what it says in English and in Spanish, Shepherd the Woods, Iglesia Lutherana, uh, Lutheran Church, Mission Parma. And so Shepherd the Woods, in reality, is having four places of worship per weekend. Um, four different locations, Southside, Lakeshore, uh, there in Tarma, and also up the uh, hill in uh, one call as well. How many services do we have on a weekend? Uh, eight. We have eight services per weekend, six in the United States, and two. Yes? Fine. Right there, it's perfect. <laughs> And so eight worship services in four locations, and we want to try to describe how that happened. Uh, this symbol uh, really uh, is interesting that it was developed by a previous Roman Catholic priest. If we ask what's the center of the Lutheran Church, it's word and sacrament. That is, according to the confessions, where the church exists where the word is preached and the sacraments are administered correctly. Now the reality is we do lots of things at church. We have fellowship meals, uh, we have youth activities, we have auctions, we have uh, uh, worship time. But the real center of the church is its mission. Christ describes for us in the next uh, sheet here, uh, the Great Commission, uh, Jesus says to us, we ought to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I've taught you. There's the word, there's the meal that's coming together, that's forming the Christian church. And that's what we're doing uh, as we have our history at Shepherd of the Woods. And in fact, what each of us is called to, you're, you're, right now, not one of us is in Peru. We're in Jacksonville. And we always have that mark of the cross on our foreheads, and we're always called to be in mission, to be making disciples of others. And so we're, we're looking for where the needs are, where the struggles are, and inviting people to know the good news of Jesus Christ. But it's more than that. It's also uh, in the world. Uh, you're going to receive power, and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. What we've noticed uh, in our ministry as we went first to Arizona is that there's a part of the faith that says it needs to go beyond our boundaries, beyond the people we meet, and make sure that it gets known in other places. And so, uh, years ago, uh, after going to one trip to Arizona, uh, we were led to begin to do ministry in Peru. And we served first in Lima, and then moved up to Tarma. And what we find there is the same impact. Even though we're <coughs> speaking English, they speak Spanish, uh, we're 3,000 miles apart, the people there are involved in the witness and the outreach as well. <coughs> So the community of Juan Paul is assisting in Tarma. The people of Tarma are doing ministry work with us uh, and even when we're not there. So it's making disciples 
but it's in all places. And that is a real blessing. In this day and age, it's getting harder and harder for denominations or churches to plant churches. Um, and, and it's a real struggle. How do you do that? How do you plant the seed? Well, we believe it's by word and sacrament. It's by the presence of Christ. And so you're going to hear the history of how uh, the mission developed there, where it began. Uh, didn't begin with building a church. It began with being the church present there. So I think uh, Pastor is... No, okay, Roxanne was some of it. Because people say, you know, what time zone? Same time zone we are. 
except when we do that silly little daylight saving time thing. And then we mess up our Skype sessions with Pastor Morocco because we tell him, oh yeah, we're, you know, we're meeting at this time and we've changed time and his time and our time aren't the same anymore. But other than that, same time zone. So those are just little fun facts about Peru. Okay. So the first mission trip, 2005. Long time ago, as a youth trip. It was originally started as a youth trip. Um, ended up being about 27 people going that year. Um, I think it was 12 youth, 3 chaperones, and 15 adults, something like that. And uh, it, it's been wide open ever since. The first trip, we did not go to Tarma. We were not introduced to Tarma until 2006. Um, and we had our first worship service. This is Pastor Johnson. It's a Catholic chapel uh, in Tarma where they allowed us to have a worship service. And that was the point that they were saying they wanted to hear more. They saw us working in the area. They saw us doing things for people. Um, Volunteerism, kind of a strange concept to the people uh, in Peru. But this is this is kind of where it all began in Tarma. In if, if, if I could just uh, mention one thing. Uh, does anybody remember in church when we passed the yarn around? Yeah, yeah. We had one skein of yarn that went roll by roll by roll went up into the balcony. Yeah. And uh, we then took that to that yeah. room. And that's where we connected everybody up in that room, and then we cut the pieces and left it with them and said, uh, we will be back. And we were hoping and praying that that, I was hoping and praying that was going to be true, that it seemed as if God was calling us there. But if you had a, a hand on that yarn, it ended up going to that chapel just moving to be there. Oh, I'm glad you remember that. That was fun. That, that was really cool. <coughs> um, I remember sitting with a group of girls, the kids sitting on my lap. 2007, couldn't get to Tarma. The central highway in between, uh, there's a lot of mines. Mining is the largest industry in Peru, and there's a lot of mines along that highway. Uh, the miners were upset by some things and uh, would block the roads with rocks and large plants and glass, broken glass, and all kinds of things. And um, trucks and buses and cars would actually get stuck on that highway for multiple days at a time. So we decided it was not in our best interest to go spend our mission trip on the highway between the two cities. So we did not go in 2007. In 2008, um, the Orphanage and Elderly Center in Charma is called the Beneficencia, and they had a building that they were not using, and we could work with them doing some work providing bedding and um, some things for the children as, as well as the elderly, and they were saying, you know, use this building. Well, that didn't quite work out. There were some things that didn't get settled. But this is where that was going to be. And as we know, God and his wisdom and his ultimate timing are always perfect. And it turns out that was a good thing. Because this building is now the Beneficentia. They turned the place where they were living at that time into a bus stop. Into a big bus terminal. So the elderly and children are living in this building now. So it was meant for them all along. So God is good. Uh, we also form Lutheran Social Services of Tarma, which is just like our Lutheran Social Services here. It just provides care for people in church. Provides care for people in need, and you'll hear more about that later. Uh, 2009, uh, the restaurant we had been uh, eating at on our trips um, became a worship center. We had a uh, worship seat where we're eating here the restaurant sign there, and that's where we started worship in 2009, and we identified that he managed to be our leader for the Lutheran Social Services of Tarma. Uh, the restaurant was owned by Fatty, and Fatty had um, 
seen us, and he was one of the people who was really touched by that we would come 3,000 miles to help total strangers, when as a rule, they were not even helping each other. No, that one was not a driver. No, he, he provided our meals. He provided, he had, he had the discotheque. And our first, in 2006, when we were there, we actually ate at the discotheque before it opened at night. Yeah, you may be thinking of Jose's brother, Raul, yeah, yes, yes. who was the bus driver, yes. who became instrumental in yeah. the Lima development. Yes, yes, who we still um, keep track of. Okay? Okay, 2010, we meet Pastor Araujo, and he provided two sides with Pastor Johnson and at the time Amy Phillips uh, at the first worship service there. Uh, we had seven baptisms in one call, so the, the churches are starting to develop now. They're starting to want to hear more of the word and the sacraments as they find and they realize that this is the foundation of their faith and this is the foundation that we come from in doing what we do. Uh, in 2011, we convert that back wall of the restaurant into a church. You see a cross here. A little stained glass, you can't really see it, but there's a dove there. And we convert that into Shepherd of the Woods Mission Tarma. And we install Pastor Rajos, the mission development, development pastor for the church. So that's only been in 2011. Sometimes I think things seem like they've been just going on forever, but it's really a pretty short time frame. Uh, we had four more baptisms in Tarma this time. Uh, anybody involved with the Kui Festival we had? <laughs> that was like more fun than like ever. Uh, I don't know how much fun you had here, but the party went on till after 11 o'clock at night there. <laughs> uh, we played games. Uh, we actually had a live Kui. Kui's are guinea pigs. Uh, they call them Kui there for the sound that they make. And played games, and we that was our first Skype session between the two places, which is I think just an awesome piece of technology to be able to uh, interact like that for 3,000 miles and share in the experience. So that was fun. Right at like a year and a half after we did this, the church property uh, also has a housing facility in the back was sold. Uh, the new owner has been gracious and has allowed us to stay there and continue with the church. Um, although. There is no contract or anything to know exactly how long that will last. So we began searching for a permanent home. 2013, we actually had a Skype worship between the two places with the 915 service in Jacksonville and the service there. Um, the people there sang a song in Spanish. The people of Jacksonville sang back in English, um, shared some things, and it was just... That is really cool. It's cool to share, but sharing in worship, sharing in our faith over that distance in multiple languages you know, is, is a very special thing and i um, very thankful for that. Had eight more baptisms. Uh, pastor Perez is a now pastor uh, who has a church in Miami. He's originally from Cuba. Uh, he's fluent in Spanish. And he was met at some of the conventions that the pastors went to, and he um, was gracious enough to provide us with some theological discussions in Spanish. The guys we have as translators when we go down there are awesome young men and very fluent and helpful, and I don't know what we do without them, but theology's not their thing. So we finally had an, uh, a Lutheran pastor who, who was able to discuss some theology <coughs> with Pastor Arapo and enable us to kind of narrow in on um, where the differences between Catholicism and Lutheranism are and help him have more education. Um, there was an input blessing in one call, and the first 10 First Communion, these kids go to a school called Chuchapampa. And we have had contact with them uh, most of the time we have uh, visited Tama. And they have been pestering Pastor Arapo that they want worship 
into Chicago. They want Bible study. They, they, they keep bugging, we keep bugging. Well, we started out with first communion classes. And they would actually come into Tarma. We originally said, you know, we figure out something to do. No, no, no. We will come. And they did. And these ten children had their first meal while we were there. And it's quite a celebration. The church was all decorated fancy. The kids were in uh, uh, boys wearing suits, the girls were in pretty dresses. And it was, it was a celebration. And that was really special. Okay. Statistics, just a little tidbit about the mission. We've gone on 14 trips over the last nine years. Uh, 11 of them have been to Tarma over eight years. Um, that, that's a lot. That really is a lot when you think about it. Um, 118 different people have made at least one trip. That's a lot of people. Um, 68 of those people have been more than once. There's about, I forget how many have been more than twice, and then there's eight people who have been more than five times. So it's a uh, warning, you can get hooked. Warning, God can, God can snatch your heart and uh, bring this to you. This picture right here, I had mentioned this is at the peak. This is at the 15,808-foot peak, and it is snow. And the picture of the snow. But these are pictures of missionaries over the years. Uh, we've had a total of 19 baptisms now between Karma and one call. The 10 First Communions. There was one wedding last summer. There was our first wedding in Karma. Uh, there's been five funerals. Uh, each Sunday, there's between 30 and 40 worshipers at the chapel in Parma, and between 25 and 35 at the chapel in Wong Call. The Wong Call population fluctuates depending upon which crops are being harvested at the time. It's an agricultural community, and they will have Sundays when there's no men there because they're all out in the field needing to harvest the crops. And so now it is time for Pastor Phillips, and they're going to give you be giving you some more details on how all this developed. That was just snapshots. A reading from Matthew. <clears throat> then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee, or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and welcome thee, or naked and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick or in prison and visit thee? You've heard some of the story now, you've heard some of the statistics, and it is quite impressive, I mean, if you, if you think about it. Um, we didn't go to Peru with the intention of finding ourselves here today in the situation we're at. Uh, we weren't intentional, but I do believe God was intentional in uh, what has occurred there in the mission development. And that really was, all we wanted to do was bring the care of Christ, as Pastor Tom be the church, to, to be the witness and, and to serve and to care for people in need. And so on our second visit to Tarma in 2008, uh, after seeing the need and, and hearing the need and, and experiencing it for ourselves, we understood God was going to do something. And God was doing something. And uh, that was the formation of uh, social services of Tarma. There is no doubt uh, in Tarma and at lots of places in Peru. The needs are extensive. I mean, beyond anything one congregation could ever possibly do, but you know, we have this kind of a, a set and steam of you know, one person at a time, one family at a time, one community at a time. So the one that is put before us is the one we are called to serve. And while there are, in the United States, we are blessed, for better or for worse, whichever you view it is, but we are blessed. Uh, that there are resources available when you are struggling, when you are hungry, when, when you need clothing, when you need education, and all those things. In the United States, we have that as an option for us. In Peru, they don't. The, the idea of a food bank it is foreign, literally. Uh, foreign. And, and so all these, these ways that we would normally receive help 
is not the way that they would receive help there. And so we go and we start with the basics. Feeding the tummy. All right? And, and uh, we did. We started um, uh, with the uh, basics. And uh, we started with providing food for one to two families a week. It was $100 for the week, or it was $100, and the food would actually last longer than a week. But we just adopted a family or two a week, and we would get them food. You know, maybe, or maybe not, how difficult it is when you are just starving physically. And Fatty was always talking about, we need to start with the basics. And so this is, you can see the smiles and, uh, and that of the food that is being delivered to these families. Um, these are their homes. It's, you know, for, for many of us, uh, their homes aren't even as nice as our garages. And uh, so we would deliver the food uh, to them. Um, but uh, following that, uh, we were like, well, what's another way we can help? And Fatty introduced us to the idea of, uh, you know, there are many programs out there, adopt a child, sponsor a child. Um, and so one of the things we know that can have a huge impact on a family's life is the child's ability to go to school and receive an education. Sorry, I think I'm blocking you guys over there. Uh, and receive an education. And uh, to do that in Peru, it's the law to have a uniform. You have to have a uniform to be able to go to school. And uh, many of these families that we have become aware of don't have those resources. So we would sponsor uh, every year a uh, school uniform drive, which is coming up in March, I believe, and uh, provide an opportunity for children to go to school. Fadi uh, screens them to find out you know, who are the ones that are in most need and, and most economic status, that there is absolutely no chance that they would be able to go to school this semester without our assistance. And so there it is, obviously. You can see the beginning and the end. You know, they're like, what? Uniforms? School? I mean, we grumbled with a, I just finished seminary. I kind of grumbled with going to school once in a while. But there, it's like, they want to be in school. And uh, it is just a blessing that we can do that. Um, LSST, Lutheran Social Services of Tarma, then continued to expand. And we started doing medical needs, uh, clothing, providing water for families, uh, electricity. Uh, Fanny would become kind of this advocate of when there was a need, um, you know, trying to find resources that could help. Uh, we do the Christmas program. Some of these children, uh, they will not even have a meal for Christmas. And for three dollars, American dollars, we've adopted children and, and they get presents for Christmas and hot chocolate and panettone. And uh, all we're doing is reminding them that Christ cares that they have not been forgotten, that somebody cares for them. And uh, it is ministry, um, it is, is our faith in action. And this is our faith in action. And I wanted to finish then that reading from Matthew here. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. All we're doing is bringing that care of Christ, um, being the church. And uh, it's no different than being the church here. You all are involved in missions even locally here. We bring care to the Salzbacher Center, to the homeless shelters, to, to wherever it is, to Alabama, whatever missions you do, even in Charleston. That is what we're called to do. And we've just been blessed that we get to do it in Peru as well. It happened in 2009, and it's all 2009's fault. Yeah, no, not really. Uh, but we were providing an eye clinic in the main uh, square of Tarma, and almost every town in Peru has a town square with a Catholic church and a water fountain, and that's usually where the, the community gathers. And we were providing an eye clinic where we brought hundreds of eyeglasses there, and the doctor was seeing them and getting these people, you know, nothing like a grown man with glasses like this big that were donated from somebody in 1970. But what a gift to that person who couldn't see before that. And across the square comes a lady to, uh, to some of our volunteer workers over there and says, will you baptize my child? She didn't ask for money. She didn't ask for anything material. She asked for something spiritual in the midst of us just being 
the church. We have to respond. I, I mean, if that's not God saying, okay, people, you've got this. Let's keep going. Let, let, let's form and establish something. And, uh, and that is, uh, it kind of reminded me uh, of the story of Philip and the eunuch. What's to prevent that from happening? Well, the reality is we didn't really have an official church community at the time. And so, there we go. We uh, get a church community. God is awesome to me. And uh, you've heard the story already about the uh, first worship uh, service there um, the, in the restaurant there. And this is the community of Wong Hall. It is no longer just filling the basic needs of food and water and shelter and all of that. We are now called to be there to serve a spiritual need. And uh, as uh, worship had been done in these oops, sorry, in those previous years, uh, you know, it was clear God was calling us to, uh, to a new uh, way of serving in uh, Tarma, Peru. And uh, I sometimes got to ask myself, should I have expected anything less? Um, so, um, Shepherd of the Woods Lutheran Mission Tarma was formed, and uh, the community now gathers not just when we come, but they gather every week. They gather for the Christmas, they gather for funerals, they gather for community events. They are gathering as a community, much as we do in our own settings. Uh, Pastor Araujo was installed, as Roxanne talked about, as our mission developer. And, uh, of course, if you know anything about Trevor in the Woods, if there's a street, we're out there waving. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, we are waving now. We do the evangelism. Um, these, uh, we had stickers made, and one of the uh, drivers uh, uh, that drove us around, we had like, what, 6,000 stickers or something? They were everywhere. They were on people's cars, on their headlights. I mean, they were everywhere, and it's kind of uh, interesting. But that evangelism of, of being made aware that this community gathers there. Are you going to be talking about the cult part? No, I don't know. Okay. Um, so now we have a community that gathers. These are the, some of the baptisms that are, are taking place. And uh, they are now receiving word and sacrament on a weekly basis, just as we are. A people hungry, physically, and spiritually now being tended to. And uh, so today that community has been established, and, and uh, what's really interesting is that they are now joining us in the mission. It is no longer just us going and serving them. They're like, oh no, we're helping. Oh yeah, we're on this. Uh, it is them serving their community when we're not there. That idea of volunteerism was not a word in their vocabulary. They're on self-survival mode. And now here, the offerings, they don't have much. Uh, the offerings um, are really, uh, they will bring the leftover rolls. They'll bring, they'll bring a cup of rice for another person. So they're, just, they're, they're learning to serve one another in the midst of the community, and not just themselves, but the larger community. And so uh, uh, we went, we saw, and we served. And we have received the blessing and the gift of this mission. And we have been blessed by all from the resources to do this mission. This is our benevolence dollars at work. Again, perspective is everything. This entire mission for a year is one of our church's mortgage payments. For an entire year, we are able to do that mission over there. And it is by the Spirit's power that we are equipped and gifted to be able to respond uh, to God's call to us. Um, there certainly are lots of places we could be, but God's called us to Peru. And it's been a real blessing uh, to be there. So at this time, I'll uh, invite Pastor Johnson up, and he's going to talk about the development. Uh, to be honest, um, our response is better than our leadership. We, we don't have a plan and say, well, we're, we're intending to do this and we've got these plans, but instead, try to keep our eyes and ears open for the opportunities and the leading of the Spirit. 
And that's really important. It, it isn't just our dream. It's a dream that God gives us, really more than a dream, a vision. When we went to um, uh, Tarma, what was really clear as we got a sense of what was happening there is that uh, evangelical churches, that's parentheses, anybody who isn't Roman Catholic, is lumped together in what's called cults. Now, it doesn't have quite the pejorative nature that uh, our word does, but it's not looked on very highly. They're considered outsiders who are there really benefiting themselves, doing something for their church, trying to accomplish something for themselves. And so the beginning of our ministry there was with Lutheran Social Services of Tarma, specifically saying we are in mission as the caring body of Christ, and we want to identify what the needs are. We heard that um, volunteerism is not something that is done in Peru. Now, if you're in survival mode, it's a little hard to be thinking about the people down the street when you're trying to survive and get enough food for your children um, and not to pay the light bill. See, that's one of the advantages. The real poor in Peru don't have to worry about paying the light bill, not because it's free, but because it doesn't exist. And when you go to the homes and the walls are black, not from painting, but from smoke, not from the stove, but from the fire, you get a sense of just how great those needs are. They far exceed anything that I've seen in my life in the United States. I've been everywhere, but this is a really challenging, challenging place. So as we provided the care, surely we did have others who began to join with us. And as you heard the description, people who were hungry, not just for the rice and the oil that we were providing, but also for the word. The woman who came with her child and said, I'd like you to baptize my child, said that to Marty Vance. Now, by note, Marty is a female, okay? She doesn't wear a collar. She's standing there across the street from the large Roman Catholic cathedral, and the people are asking her. Now, do they know anything about Lutheranism? Only as much as they see it in action. And where they want the, their child to be identified is with the living, breathing, serving body of Christ. And I take that as just an extraordinary statement. That they would say, whatever you're doing, whoever you are, I want my child connected to that. And what we're seeing there in uh, Tarma and in Wankal and in the other communities Fanny lets us know of a really poor area, a really poor school. We bring your donations and your resources, and we bring the care. And, and the overwhelming thanksgiving is something we accept on your behalf, but it's, it's tremendously moving. And we have gone back to some areas, as was mentioned, Chucho Pampa, uh, where we've worked with the schools. We built a, a room there. And uh, it was late at night, and we had planned uh, the next day to try to get on one day of kind of a little tour thing. We had been there for whatever length of time, and we couldn't get it finished. And we asked the group, we said, okay, those who want to go on the touring thing tomorrow, go ahead. But some of us are going to continue and finish up this classroom for these kids. And to a person, everyone stayed. Everyone worked on that room. And when we finally finished in the cold of the night and uh, in the dark, we had little flashlights, we're trying to see where we're nailing, and we met in the director's office, the director who still comes and now worships at Tarma. And, uh, and uh, we're meeting there and sipping some wine and some others are eating the gluten cookies that I couldn't eat. Uh, and uh, uh, a uh, teacher came up and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, what does it take to become a Lutheran? Now, we're not doing a sales pitch. We're not leaving flyers. We're not, we don't have a church. So it wasn't about trying to get more Lutherans in the world. It was being a Lutheran in the world. And the response of people to that is extraordinary. Now, we couldn't say much. We said, we'll leave some VBS materials. And uh, you can work with the kids. Years later, that's the group of children who come for First Communion. And those people coming from Chichapapa, 
if, if Eshel Robo had moved to one call uh, or to Tarmel. He lives in Lima. I have to drive five miles from my house to get to church, sometimes 15 miles to get down to the lakeshore. He travels 150 miles, six plus hours, every weekend to get there and the same to return every weekend. He's done that for the last two years. A dedicated churchman, a person who says also, I would like to be Lutheran. He could not continue in that ministry in the Roman Catholic Church um, asking and getting stuff from people to do the free care of Christ. And so he identifies strongly with the Lutheran perspective of the faith. So at this point, then, the ministries develop, and the community of worship develops. And uh, we're worshiping. We did the best we could and converted a, uh, a, a restaurant into a chapel. We've done that. And that's what I wanted to highlight a little bit of just what's happening in Tarma is no different than what's happened here. I've got a first quiz question, and I'm going to give an extra part of my, well, my Spalonis going on, sorry. Uh, I'll uh, give you something. If you can tell me, if you didn't come to the last meeting, where is the first place the people of Shepherd of the Woods worship? School gym. No. House. You said that. How did you know that? Just guess. You made a good guess. All right, I owe you some Spalonis, Jason. <laughs> In, in Pastor Wendt's house. Pastor Wendt was sent as a parachute drop. Uh, there weren't a group of people who said, send us a pastor. The American Lutheran Church sent him. And he advertised and said, does anybody want to do Lutheran ministry in the Bay Meadows area? And Alice Franzen, responding, I'm sure also for Don, said, yes, we would. First phone call. And they began to worship in his house until not enough room. And then they rented the gymnasium over at the Country Day School. Uh, and then, in 1985, went from the gymnasium and bought property. The sign says, uh, future home of. And uh, the name, Shepherd of the Woods, that's the property where there's not a tree left on the property anymore. There are a couple, a couple of trees, but not many. Uh, but that's what it looked like. And when the sanctuary was first put up, this is what it looked like, a little arbor on the way in, no uh, offices uh, with uh, Roxanne's office and Pastor's office and a little gathering area. That was the building, 4,000 square feet. And it expanded because as you do ministry and as you're faithful, other people gather with you and say, we'd like to serve as well. And so the uh, construction of the uh, Shepherd Center in 1993, uh, 95 uh, additional classrooms, uh, and uh, 97, 99 the gathering area, 2001 the sanctuary. All of that as a way of responding to what God was doing in our midst. Now, you know perhaps, if you've been around for a while, that this didn't last very long. Um, as, as glorious, we thought we had died and gone to heaven. Anybody remember what we called that place? The final sanctuary. Now, I would admit to you that since then, we have worshipped, I think, about eight other places. But we thought if we could ever get to a sanctuary, God would have blessed us and Christ would return. And that's what he's waiting for. If we could just do this. We did this. And in two years, it was no longer effective as a mission tool. And that led then to the next. We found the land, 40 acres down uh, the Lakeshore property, and our very first worship there was outside. Anybody remember what uh, particular Sunday it was? Easter Sunday, and the uh, birds, uh, the mockingbirds, were up in the pine tree as we're singing, morning is broken like the first morning, and it was just extraordinary. Uh, and uh, the mist was going over the water, and an eagle swoops down as the mist is coming up. Um, it, it was, yeah, you had to be there to really experience Easter at the lakeshore. Uh, we had asked how many people were coming. 70 said they would come. Anybody remember how many were there at sunrise? 150 people. And we ran out of chairs and tables and stools and ground, and it was extraordinary. 
So we moved from that, a uh, little tough in rainy weather. Uh, there's good protection. We bought a gospel tent out of Miami tents. Um, and I had our own swamp cooler, uh, like the Methodist, anybody Methodist background, we did tent revival for a while. Uh, the, the swamp cooler sat in the back and blew cool air kind of down the center. It was damp, but cool air down the center. And that's where, um, uh, let me see, Lady and Sugar uh, laid down. Anybody remember Lady and Sugar, a pit bull and a German shepherd? And they would come to church every Sunday and lay in the center aisle. You know? We had to ask them to move before people would come up for communion. <laughs> that was for the first year when Joe Mora still owned the property and was still didn't own it, but was still on the property. When he left, we took the barn he had and we converted it. It was about twelve thousand uh, dollars. It was really easy to work on. We could work on everything, electricity, whatever else. Um, if you can't be illegal twice, like if you're illegal and illegal becomes legal, I don't know, maybe. But um, Joe never permitted that building. <laughs> so it's hard to get an electrician to come and pull a permit on a building that doesn't exist. So we played with that ourselves and turned that where his boat was and his garage doors and turned it into the sanctuary. Same siding, same cross on the wall uh, to kind of imitate the, uh, the south side property. This is worship inside. Seated about 90 people uh, and it was a lot of fun. 2008, we moved over it, but it wouldn't continue to fit. We built the uh, sanctuary in 2008, um, and it's not a sanctuary. It's actually a school building. Now we took half of it, and where do we meet in the faith center? Who knows? Anybody know what, what room we meet in? It's the cafeteria. Yes, there's a code issue there. I'm sure there's some issue. Uh, but nonetheless, we're in the dining room, uh, and we break bread together. So it's not improper. Uh, and so we worship there, and it becomes a multi-purpose building, not unlike the original uh, faith uh, center. So that's, that's how it develops. You, you provide care, you invite people to join you in that giving of care, you gather around word and sacrament, and development happens. Which then, as we go to Peru, uh, this is street worship. Uh, we, we do it once, we can do it anywhere. Uh, we do it there uh, in uh, the streets uh, of Lima. Uh, they weren't like real streets. I mean, they're streets, but dirt. That's dirt. It's outside. The uh, main building was here. Uh, and then we got really fancy one time. Anybody recognize what that is? It's a tent. <laughs> yeah, that's great draping, which they stretch, and you can pay somebody to come set it up. And I do remember that one immensely because you couldn't fit in the church. When we brought our missionaries and the community gathered at the same time, you couldn't fit. So we just blocked the road. There weren't a lot of cars. No, not, nobody really owns cars there. But anyway, we blocked the street, and everybody's invited. And I remember, anybody was at that service, raise your hand. Anybody remember how that service ended? No. <laughs> so, so we're finishing it. We're working the room and doing fellowship, and all of a sudden, buses arrive, backing up the streets with their exhaust blowing into the tent. And it was time, as a Lutheran pastor, I've done more than I ever should. Uh, it was time for the blessing of the buses. <laughs> the Vanessa Bus Company, that had been our help throughout the Lima trips and even up the Tarma, brought all of their buses over. And uh, you know, I didn't have that. I missed that class in seminary about the blessing of buses. So I did the best blessing of a bus I could do. Anyway, uh, so we worship there, and then. We do get up to Tarma, and uh, what happened in, in Lima was kind of a little bit of a concern. In one of the uh, churches that we worked with, Church of Amaus, uh, we took the second story of their building, which was open, and closed it. Uh, bamboo and, and nothing fancy, but some cement walls and some walls and windows and a spire. And no sooner had finished than the family that said, oh yes, you'll always be able to use this, said, uh, we kind of need that back now. So we built their second story, not ours. Uh, the other church from Raul, uh, uh, again, multi-site, much as we do here, they moved in Lima. 
The one site uh, moved over 45 minutes away, and there's another setting of worship, and Pastor Andres serving at both places for a while. Um, and that place as well, just an empty lot, and uh, repaid to have a church, a wooden kind of church, wooden walls, in Lima they do it that way, and a roof, and some fans, and uh, no sooner put in the cement floor than the family that said, uh, of course you can use this all you want, then needed that land. So the community there took the church apart, moved over to an empty vacant lot, put it up over there, till that family said, uh, we need the land now. And so it's a challenge when you don't own the property and you're moving from pillar to post. In this case, we didn't have an option. We're just beginning. What are we going to do in Tarma? We took a restaurant, put up some extra walls. Uh, I want to tell you that wood is, is you know, God, I don't know. He's protecting the rainforest by making it very difficult for us to use their wood. It is harder than a rock. It's like driving nails uh, into cement. Um, anyway, we put that up. Uh, here's the, uh, anybody recognize a Shepherd of the Woods chancel step? What's worship without a short guy being above you guys? So, Pastor <laughs> Rowe is no tall guy either. So, we ra raised that up. Um, I, I mean, you understand? I mean, we don't, no habla espanol. Is God at work in this place or not? How does the community gather? Um, when we're in an old restaurant in the middle of a street with no advertising, nobody knows what a Lutheran is, but everybody knows what a Lutheran does. And that's the impact of what's going on here. So, how's that look for church? <laughs> hey, yeah, well, all right, this is not ours. This is the neighbor who's building his uh, land, uh, his building over there. This is the property. It's it is 20 meters by 10 meters. You might know what that is foot wise. 33 by 66. 33 by 66, which is um, a total of 2,178 feet. That, that's all it is. Okay? If you show the next map, we'll show you where this is. This is Shea Restaurant. Uh, it doesn't look like that, but, you know, a uh, symbol of where their worship is going on now. Main Street, cutting through Tarma, the Las Portales Hotel, where we have stayed at times, and then uh, in this back developing area where new construction is going on, where infrastructure is already there of water and sewer and power, which is not in a lot of the places that are there. Uh, this land was found by factory. Uh, the, uh, one of the challenges about, I think it was 90%, he said, 90% of all the land for sale, sale in Peru has a title, which in America is a good thing. But in Peru, what it means is that person owns the property, which is good, but it does not say whether he has sold it to somebody else. Title simply means he, he is the owner of that property. But he might go to somebody else, sell it to them. He might sell it to them. He might sell it to them. So until they get what's called script, the paper written up where a, uh, uh, what's it called, notary, which again in Peru is different from America. Anybody here a notary? It, it costs X number of dollars, you have to be bonded, other than that, there's no, not a lot of tests or anything, you say, can you check the license, do you know this person? In Peru, the only one who can be a notary is a lawyer. And in all of Tarmi, you know, how many, not how many notaries in Jacksonville? Thousands upon thousands. How many notaries in Tarmi? One. He is the notary of Tarma. And when he says, this has been checked out and uh, the guy who owns it is also has not sold it to anybody else, uh, that's uh, what's happened. So, uh, if you'll go back here, that's where the land is. This is the property. You say, well, how much could you do on 2,178 feet of land? Anybody have any idea what the fellowship hall is? At, uh, at uh, Southside? Nope. The, the, the room itself, Fellowship Hall. 2,000. Yeah, a little less than 2,000. 1,954 feet. Uh, Pastor Mefford's husband 
is the one who calculated that. That's not a square room. So I said, Tom, please, can you tell us how many feet is that? So it's 1,954 feet. Uh, now, what's interesting, you said, well, that's not really a lot of, lot of land, especially not when the cost is $46,000, which it is. However, um, this property, it is possible to build two stories. If you go to two stories, it's 4,356, and that includes, if you want to picture what that would look like, the Shepherd Center, next to our main building in Southside, and the four classrooms. When the dreams, if you're connected to Shepherd Woods, you've got to have dreams, visions, um, their picture is uh, doing a school. Uh, you're going to do that on on uh, you know, 33 by 66 feet, you go up one floor. Actually, this property will allow it to go up three stories. And at that point, you have 6,534 feet, which is the size, just about within a couple hundred feet, of the faith center down at the lakeshore. Actually, this property can go up four stories. And by the time you go to four stories, you have 8,700 feet, and uh, that is uh, the Faith Center uh, all the way, the annex, starting at Southside, all the way up to the entrance of the sanctuary on that property, uh, as small as it is in that area. So, we're at this point now where we believe, and we have been there for years, looking at it, this is the developing area. This property is uh, going to the house that's going up along the way. Uh, our goal is to purchase that land. And our goal would be this summer to begin to clear, well, it's not quite clearing and grubbing if you don't have any plants, but uh, we're going to clear the land. And then uh, it'll be interesting. We'll be showing you pictures a year from now of what went up. Uh, was it a tent? I don't know if I can get the gospel tent from down at the lakeshore in my bags or whether they'll mail it there. Uh, I don't know what that will do. Uh, a tent? Uh, is it a uh, building? Is it the beginning of a building? We don't know. But we do know this would be Shepherd of the Woods Lutheran Church Mission Tarma owned by this congregation. We are registered in Peru both as LSST, the ministry program, as well as the church. And we would be purchasing this as Shepherd of the Woods Jacksonville. So if at some point we decide this is going to be uh, a better use for a four-story apartment building and we're going to go get land elsewhere, we sell it, the proceeds are ours, and we begin to do ministry somewhere else. So, how would... Yes? Do you have any idea at this point how long it would take to get a script to get it? It's, it is already has script. Oh, okay. Yes, I apologize. I never finished that. The, one of the blessings of that property is it is part of the 10%. It has script on it. So we know that it is owned, and we know the owner, because Fatty and his company bought it to make sure that it would not go elsewhere as well. So we would be buying it from Fatty's company. It's forty-six thousand. It comes with the script done. Well, then, is there a requirement that the architectural plans must be drawn by someone there, or can they have it done here? <laughs> we have to show some more pictures of Peru. Oh, okay. <laughs> would you like to draw all the architectural? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah we, would, we would get somebody, and it could be ours where we sketch out some design, working with the people there of what the, the needs are, uh, and getting an architect I would expect there. Uh, but uh, very honestly, there's not a lot of code, there's not a lot of uh, any... I've never seen a building inspector. If there is one, there must be, but I don't know where he would be or why. You'd be there because the nobody has to come. This People is, connect up the wires out on the street, do 20 lines, and they're running back over there. This has become your favorite place, hasn't it? Is, it? it is. It is a good place. <laughs> <laughs> I guess primarily about getting handicapped from the bottom floor up to the main floor. Yes. Is right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there are no code issues yeah. um, relative. It's what ministry would be done in each. Um, right now, in, in the restaurant, uh, there are some huge uh, handicap um, impediments, um, yeah. but nonetheless, they get there. Um, the free area that's given by the city is in the stadium, and they go down stairs into this basement totally. There, there's no handicap anything there. 
and uh, nobody sues. Uh, the sidewalks have holes in them. You can break your ankle, and you know it's it's a different world. Um, we should take the iPad and just walk around to give you a sense of uh, people build whatever they want to build, and we would want to have it secure enough so that if we build one story that we can add on the second without a problem or the third or whatever from there. Yeah, so the best things in Peru are relatively inexpensive. The yeah. dollar goes a long way. Why is this property so yeah. expensive by comparison? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, is it because there's so little property there that has infrastructure going to it? That what makes it so expensive? Um, we looked at land that was similar in cost that did not have paved roads, uh, sidewalks, or infrastructure. Land, for, there are two things that are really expensive in Peru. One is electric equipment, like saws and drills and stuff like that. For whatever reason, that's really expensive and land. And whether it's because as a realtor we know, it's the only thing they're not making more of. And some of uh, Tarma is the pearl of the Andes. That's the way it's known. Uh, uh, agricultural, uh, plants, uh, flowers, tremendous things, and these properties will have been in the in the family's name for many, many years. Uh, and we looked at land, uh, I mean, we looked at one building years ago, $180,000. American, they don't talk so much. And it, it really, from our perspective, the property we're worshiping in, in the Shea restaurant, went for sale. And this is when we really began to see just how odd it is. They were offered, and they offered it to us first. They said, well, you're using it, would you like to buy it? As well, how much? $70,000. For a usable area that we're using is less than this, and there was some buildings behind it, but of no particular, you know, design, nothing fancy. $70,000. We said, who in the world is going to buy it? Forget it. We'll be here good forever. How long did it take? Um, eight months was gone. <clears throat> no, but now owned by a new owner, and at, at any point she says, we're going to really develop this and you guys got to get off. I, I'm not, we don't have a contingency plan on where the worshippers go. It's so remote, but I guess it's growing pretty quickly too. Yeah, it, it is a beautiful area. People from uh, Lima, from the other big, are, are going there and they're putting up some homes and uh, some are future planning. One property we looked at um, where Shaka, musician for the community, um, is a contractor. Well, he's a concrete mason. And so he was staying there and he showed us the work he was doing. And we look out the front door and there's no road. Um, and, and the property next door is like down 15 feet. And, and here's this little island. And I said, Chaka, what in the world? He said, well, someday that road is coming through here and it's going to be raised up. And so he's building for a time in the future whenever the road comes. And it's off. It's just off. Um, OK, any questions? Yes, Is Anna. there any way you can buy, eventually buy property close to that? Yes, um, well, there's land for sale. We have asked Patty to be looking, I don't know how long we've been looking now, for years, uh, literally. Um, and we, every time we go, we travel to see more. And um, there are pieces, again, if we would only look at land that there's script on, because you, you can't take a chance that a year from now we're going to find out somebody, three other people own it, um, or bought it, and now we're going to sue to get their money back. Um, so, that's a fairly small group of properties that have script and it's free and clear and we know who owns it. So those are small, but we will continue to look. We, we thought again that in Vicencia. Further out of town, uh, the land does get cheaper, but it's so far away, very few of the people involved in the ministry now will be able to make it. They're all traveling by the way. I just said, uh, what is the those, uh, there's a street right in the front. Uh, it's uh, one lot away from the corner. Uh, so it is, uh, and a few blocks from the Portales. The Portales, this is an odd thing as well, the Portales rents rooms. Uh, it's a hotel, and it rents rooms, and it's 250 American dollars a night. A night. The people who stay there have resources. Other than us, 
you know, but they, they gave it to us, I think it was $30 a night. Fatty knew the manager and got the deal. And this last time we stayed in the back, they have a kind of like it's over the garages, and we got a cheap deal there. Uh, but this is a very fancy restaurant <coughs> in Tarmac, and money is gathered. So uh, you can't quite see it, but just between Fatty and I, that's another street that comes through, and this is the curb to the street. Uh, and so sidewalk. There had been a building here, and it was torn down. And that's why you can't see it, but right on this column is where the power is. So just behind you? Yes. So, so this, there's a street here, a street here, a street here, and it is the second lot away from the cross street. And with uh, roads that are being finished around it, so it's the developing community in Palmer. And the other side here? Uh, just to the right, more homes going down the street. So the block is and do maybe. Those homes look like that one there? Um, I, I don't know um, you remember which one to the right. I did have a video of it. Yeah, they're, they're like that. The Two story. The front of the houses usually have a tile, nice shiny tile, and I think the one right here is three story. Yeah. Two or three stories. So it's it's an area where going up is the way to go. Okay. Alright. Last question, how do we do this? Uh, the land, as I said, is $46,000. Uh, our congregation voted to purchase land when it's feasible. How is that going to be feasible? Uh, we have committed already $15,000 of the vision fund to go toward that. When we did the vision appeal, we said it's going to be support a school of Lakeshore, Southside, and Peru. $15,000 has been set aside. We have also solicited funds, and we have gathered $5,000 in uh, uh, donations that have already been received, so we're at $20,000. We really believe that it is possible for us to proceed, and we're looking at the other $26,000. How do you get there? Well, praying. We, we really do ask for your prayers as we try to discover, because once you get the land, we've got more to do. There's no doubt about it. But the impact is tremendous. Participate if you're able. Uh, if you can go with us, your, your heart, your life would be changed if you're able to do that. you got to have altitude is an issue. You can't do the altitude. You really don't want to go because it is Denver, Mile High City. Forget it. That's nothing. Uh, you haven't begun to get up in the air. Um, participate in lots of other ways. Being here is your participation. You're getting a sense of what we believe God is doing through us uh, there in, in uh, Peru and in Germany. <laughs> and then give uh, donations. There are a number of ways that you can do that. We hope you will pray about it and see what you're able to do. Um, there are envelopes on your table. There are envelopes that were mailed to you with the packets of materials. I don't know if the Charles can people got that, uh, but uh, the rest of us uh, have it there. If you would like to make a donation today, you are certainly welcome to do that. Uh, we did a, a fundraiser two or three vision of missions ago, uh, and uh, gave that opportunity. To, to me, it seems like you ought to think about it, pray about it, and decide what you'd like to do. Uh, but someone actually in that meeting pledged $150,000, which was, I said, oh, that's a good start. No, that, that was the highest, the highest one, actually. Uh, but they, they left it at the door on the way out. So, heaven forbid we not in I'll be right back that. here. Yeah. <laughs> Secondly, uh, we have the square, uh, and if you're familiar with that, if you want to use your credit card, make a donation, pay it off over time, there it is on uh, Pastor's iPhone, it's all private, it's everything else, and uh, it gets cleared from her phone, uh, that is possible. Um, and, and then your donation that can be mailed in at any time. Uh, as we gather the funds, uh, we are really looking to try to finalize this. So, I mean, just consider if you can, if you can, if you can, you can indicate I'll, I'll give X amount of dollars in the future or how long it would take uh, or any donation that you're able to give. And that allows this to continue and develop, we believe, in really God-pleasing and appropriate ways. Rather than spend any more money on it, we would never do another thing on that restaurant. I mean, that's, you know, kind of productive. So uh, this, it seems to be, in our case, what we believe to be the next thing.
Last section, uh, there were some questions already. Any other? Yes, ma'am. How long do you have to practice As long as it takes. Oh, no time and as, yeah. But obviously, we're looking to try to do this as soon as possible. Uh, again, Fatty is holding that property for us. He's not, he's not selling it to anybody else, but he's got to pay for it. So we're, we're really looking. We have a number of people who really just in their hearts believe this is uh, the way to go. And, and they have indicated they'll be very supportive. So, but we want to give everybody the opportunity to have a piece of this and, and to take it seriously. So we're not taking advantage of anyone who's uh, you know, really committed as well. So, so any of your donations. Other questions about any of the presentation? How much of the $46,000 would you raise before we actually purchase the property? Well, we have, yeah, we, no, 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 we cannot, uh, because we have a mortgage with uh, uh, Thrivent, um, we cannot have additional mortgage. So we've got to pay for that full. <coughs> and um, so we, we're looking somewhere to gather $26,000 as quickly as we can. Because 20 is already, it's 46, well, we 20, 20 is in hand, 26000 So we close without the $46,000. Yes, we pay for it. Other questions? That's not bad. We estimated an hour and 15 minutes. I've got three minutes. Tap <laughs> <laughs> dance, little soft shoe. And, all right. We thank you very much for your attention, your time, your support, your prayers uh, for anything that is happening. Um, it is a glorious thing to see God at work and be part of this work. Um, is just extra special. And I hope that's happening with you and your ministries and uh, pray for this in our ministries. All right, Pastor, could you call us up? Gracious God, we do thank you for all the amazing things you are doing with us and in us and our friends and the communities that gather in your name. We see what you are doing, and we are blessed by this opportunity. We ask that you would bless the ministries of this congregation and those who are gathering together. They hear the word. They feel your call. They sense your presence, and the world is responding. Your people are responding. Work through this ministry, O oh Lord, and Shepherd Woods, ministry in Tarma, and those friends and co-workers in the gospel who are joining us in this. Bless this, uh, bless our reflections, Lord, and, and continue to move us in the direction your will leads us. Lord, give us your spirit. Let us know your power. Give us your direction. Not only give us the strength, O oh Lord, but also the will to do these things. We thank you for this opportunity. We ask that you would bless all those that are gathered here and bring us together, O oh Lord, in your name. Bless these things through our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Go peace, serve the Lord. Check out the pictures if you like on your way out.